I'm Diane Richardson. I'm the executive director of the Ebenezer Maxwell Mansion, Philadelphia's only authentically restored Victorian House Museum and Gardens. And on behalf of the Ebenezer Maxwell Mansion and the um, Preservation Alliance for Greater Philadelphia, we welcome you here today. I'm pleased to introduce um, American historian Mark Lloyd, and he's been associated with the mansion since it became a museum. Welcome, Mark. Well, this, I must say, is uh, a nice turnout on a beautiful spring day. And all of you should be home in your garden, probably wish you were. Um, but I won't, I won't take your whole afternoon, and I'll make sure that you have a chance to uh, get something in that you want to do later in the day. There are several people here that make this a special occasion for me, um, and I'd like to mention uh, several of them. Um, there are people active in the field of historic preservation. Is Patrick Houck here? Yes, and Laura Keim is here. Um, Laura's just been named the acting executive director, the interim director at the Germantown Historical Society. She's done a lot of good work in Germantown for the last 10 years, and I hope that the search committee will look no further <laughs> and that they'll be able to convince you to take the job. I want to... Uh, I want to thank especially the people who have served the Maxwell Mansion over the years. We have several past presidents of the board here. Uh, Doris Steinberg is here. And Susan Harrison is here. And Linda Kings is here. Um, there's been a, an awful lot of neighborhood and local initiative and effort poured into the Maxwell Mansion. And these are some of the people that we should be grateful for. Um, I want also to Thank people who have been my friends and mentors for a long time. I see Hi and Sandy Myers here, uh, whom I've known for 35 years now through another friend of ours. Um, I see Bill and Linda Coons, who've uh, been very good to me at Penn and at Germantown Friends School. Uh, there are people here, old friends from Tulpa Hawkins Street. <laughs> David and Hannah Hom are here. David and Hannah, can you? I think they're here. They may be hiding. <laughs> no, there they go. Um, Luke and Marge Russell are here. Karen Stevens is here. And I think that uh, Bernie Wilson was supposed to be here, too. Is Bernie here? We'll hold the applause for Bernie. <laughs> I think most of all we want to thank Diane Richardson, who has encouraged me to be active again with the Maxwell Mansion after a long period of time. I'm very grateful to my fellow archivist and American historian Jim Duffin, who is here at the uh, uh, table this afternoon, and Jim is the GIS map man, who you'll see his talent on the screen in a few minutes. Um, I also want to thank Sophia Ellerson, and I think that um, all of you should know she's been kind of the light of my life for the last 10 years. A few comments about the women who made this possible. Women's history. And the reason is that when you examine it a little bit, you typically discover that women are behind it all. <laughs> and in this case, it's a very interesting lineage of women who brought about Tulpa Hawkins Street. Elizabeth Wilding Powell of the Powell House downtown and of Powelton in West Philadelphia bought a piece of land 
at the corner of Germantown Avenue and High Street in 1808. And she made that available as a house and a home to her niece, a woman named Anne Willing Morris, who had been widowed at the age of 35 with six children. Thank goodness she had a rich aunt. Um, that makes a lot of difference in life. And Anne Willing Morris came out to Germantown and her home became a center for upper class life in Germantown from 1810 until her death in 1853. She was the mother of a woman named Abby Morris who married a Germantowner, I should say, the old Germantowners took note of this Morris family that was suddenly at Germantown Avenue and High Street. And it wasn't long before the Johnson family, they of Wick and the Johnson House and Uppsala, it's the same family, they sent one of their eligible bachelors down to Mrs. Morris and her eldest daughter married him. Uh, Abby Morris married Justice Johnson in 1815 and she came up the street to live here at the top of Tolpehocken Street in a house that's now gone. She in turn had six children, the youngest of whom was Susan. Susan married an Irish Spaniard by the name of John Fallon. And that's where Tolpehocken Street started. John Fallon had money, which I'm going to tell you about in a minute. And he brought in a group of investors from Spain and a group of workmen here on Tolpehocken Street. And the rest became Enterprise Unleashed. So I wanted to tell you about those four generations of women, beginning with Elizabeth Willing Powell in the 18th century and continuing through Susan Morris Fallon, who lived from 1823 until her death in 1893. Those four women made it possible for John Fallon to come to Tolpehocken Street and open it in 1850. And he opened it privately, something that's supposed to be against the law. But Jim and I have done a lot of research, and we can't find the road opening in the Philadelphia court dockets anywhere. The Fallons just said, we're going to open this street, and the courts be hanged. Um, and they did, in, sometime in the latter, latter part of 1850. And what they did is help transform Germantown. I have a couple quotations here I'd like to read to you, both of which are quite good. How many of you are Philadelphia historians who would like to think you are? <laughs> All right. Where does Philadelphia history begin? John Fanning Watson and his uh, annals of old Philadelphia. You can't study history in Philadelphia without starting with John Fanning Watson. And here's what he had to say about Germantown in 1857. We are indebted, he said, to Robert H. Thomas for the impulse first given by him to increase the houses and population of this place. He proved by his own success in laying out new streets and selling lots and building cottage homes that he had a power to attract businessmen and men of money to seek a residence for country air. He began his first operations some 12 years ago, that would have been 1845, along Center Street. Next he bought and laid out the lots on Kelly's farm his example set the two prices to work, Eli and Philip, and to lay out Price Street where I live. Germantown now is Germantown 
No longer. Germantown as it was is gone. It goes on building fancy cottages for city businessmen, etc. And a diarist that I think very highly of, and I welcome all of you to get on Amazon and buy a copy of his book. He says in 1857, this is Sidney George Fisher, another famous Philadelphia diarist, was much impressed in my drive today with the beauty of the country, the universal aspect of wealth and comfort, and the difference that a few years have made in the neighborhood of Germantown. Always, remember that, always a respectable, substantial village, but now adorned with elegance and supplied with the conveniences of a city. Shops, gas, waterworks, with none of the annoyances of town, <laughs> but quiet, country scenery, gardens and trees everywhere. The railroad and the taste for villa life have done it all. And so manifold are its advantages that the wonder to me is how anyone can bear to stay in town. <laughs> Jim, we're ready. There's an illustration that we hope to show you in a moment, despite down in the left-hand corner. I'll tell you about it as it comes up. In fact, I have some copies here. There we go. This diagonal is Germantown Avenue. This is the Tulpahocken Street tract, with this straight line being Tulpahocken Street. Here's Wayne Avenue. Hidden here a little bit is Green Street, McCallum Street. All the houses that exist now are here in the background in a kind of light gray. This is the Ebenezer Maxwell Mansion. These are the purchases that were made by the Fallon brothers in order to develop Tulpahocken Street. All in 1850 and 51, Susan Morris's husband, John Fallon, combined with his brother Christopher. They were agents, and it's true, I'm sure you've heard this, all you old Tulpahocken Streeters, they were agents of the Queen of Spain. <laughs> and her husband, the Duke of Rianzares. That's no joke. That's the real thing. And there is a collection of papers at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania which contain the letters back and forth to Spain and the investors there from the uh, nobility and aristocracy of Spain to the Fallon brothers, telling them how to invest their money. The Fallon Brothers bought 40,000 acres in Center and Clinton County, Pennsylvania, and developed a huge <coughs> ironwork operation there. So Tulpahocken Street was really small by comparison. These pieces of land that I've shown you, which aggregate to about 80 acres, cost them a total of less than $50,000. Now, in 1850, that was a lot of money. But it was small compared to what the Fallon brothers were prepared to do in Center County for their ironworks, called the Ferranville Ironworks. <coughs> There's some interesting things going on here. I'll out to you things that you might not otherwise notice. Do you see how Fallon bought little pieces of land on Washington Lane up there? And a piece of land from the Haynes family at Wick down here. Why do you suppose he did that? If you look closely, you'll see that 
That's exactly where McCallum Street and Green Street go through. He bought the land that was necessary to put the streets through, the cross streets. <laughs> then he came down here to the corner of Walnut Lane and Wayne Avenue and bought 16 acres from an agent that was uh, working for the Haynes family at Wick. And there is where the Fallons had their greatest interest. Because for as important as the real estate development was, what they had their eye on was Paper Mill Run, down below Wayne Avenue, where Lincoln Drive is now. And I'll show you in a few minutes what I mean by that. I think we're ready for the next slide. This is a map that I did of Tolpahocken Street, which I can share with anyone here by the magic that we have today of email with PDF attachments. <laughs> but I did this, if you look in the lower right hand corner, in October of 1977. So forgive its crudeness, but this was what I did at an annual meeting at the Maxwell Mansion back when I was in my 20s and the Maxwell Mansion people first welcomed me there. These are the houses that Fallon and others began to build. Adams Street is the name that used to be for McCallum Street. Here's the church, Christ Church in St. Michael's. But up here, I want to tell you a little bit, this is the house that we're in now. We're in an addition at the rear of the house. When this part back here of Christ Church in St. Michael's burned in the 1950s. Rather than rebuild it, they demolished it, and they bought this house and put an addition on the rear for their parish house. We're here. Across the street are the twin houses, 32 and 30. And then the, the house next to that, which I think is 20 or 18, and up here, the Queen's house at number nine. Those were sample houses. The Fallons built those so that when you came to Tolpahocken Street, it looked like it was a going enterprise, even if they hadn't sold any lots yet. <clears throat> it's very similar to real estate development today. Next slide. Here is the block between McCallum and Green. Note that Green at that time didn't have an E on the end. I've never heard anybody call it greeny, uh, but that's what it turned out to be. Here is the second Presbyterian church, now the Germantown Community Presbyterian Church. And for those of you who don't know, that's where I grew up, in the parsonage next door. My father was the pastor of that church. But here are the houses in the 100 block of... Tolpahocken Street in 1859. This map is laid out to show you exactly how things looked in the year that Maxwell built his house. There are three houses here which I want to point out. 112, 120, and 128 West Tolpahocken. They all look the same. They're two and a half story Italianate cottages or villas. Um, and the reason they look the same is that those three owners, Howard Williams, Franklin Shoemaker, and Israel Peterson, were brothers-in-law. And they had all hired the same builder to put those three houses up. The builder may have been this man, Joseph Evans. We're not quite sure. This George Strawbridge was the father of the first um, chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Pennsylvania, George Strawbridge, Jr. And that clan you may know, some of you may know this, they have gone on to marry into the Dorrance Campbell Soup Fortune. And there's a branch of the Strawbridges that is descended from this George Strawbridge that's very active at the highest levels 
of economic activity in the Philadelphia area today. These two Mitchells, Joseph Mitchell and his father, also Joseph, but they had different middle names, had already developed the house on the corner of Walnut Lane and Green Street. It's a house that's for sale now. I brought you some pictures of it, the way it looked in the 1860s. These are beautiful pictures. Take a look and pass it along. The Mitchells, along with Maxwell, built several houses in the neighborhood. Next slide. This is um, Green Street to Wayne Avenue with some annotations by Diane Richardson. Um, <laughs> this word is standpipe, which is the word they used in the 1850s and 60s for a water tower. Remember I mentioned the waterworks to you a moment ago. Down here is the famous house of Henry Howard Houston. One of the things I like to tease everybody from Chestnut Hill about is that Chestnut Hill likes to claim the Houston family. It's a fraud. H.H. <laughs> Houston lived his entire adult life on Tulpahawken Street. <laughs> he built that big pile up there on West Willow Grove Avenue when he was in his dotage. He was 66 or 67 years old, which I'm soon to be. <laughs> so I can tease about that now. <laughs> but you see, on this side, Tulpahawken Street was open. And this part of the 200 block of West Tulpahawken was not developed until the 1880s, and then by Houston. And there are later houses along this uh, strip of Tulpahawken Street. One of the things that you may have noticed is how many of the houses had 1858 as their date. One of the things my research showed, which I found very interesting, was that the Fallon brothers sold building lots very slowly in the 1850s. There were only half a dozen or eight sold. In April of 1858, John Fallon, the one who had married Susan Morris, Susan Johnson, excuse me. Um, John Fallon talked his brother into selling him his, the brother's, half share. I don't know what kind of a deal they had. It was for one dollar. <laughs> you know the, the language in the deeds, and good and other considerations, whatever that meant. Well, John Fallon went ahead and sold all the building lots in a hurry in 1858. More than half of the houses on Tulpahawken Street before the Civil War were sold by Fallon in the summer and fall of 1858, including the Maxwell Mansion. So there was this sudden selling off by John Fallon. And there was trouble. His brother sued him. It went into appeals. It ended up in the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. And if you Google it today on Fallon's appeal, it'll come up. A 55-page opinion about the difficulties these two brothers had in the late 1850s. Next slide. Here are some of the deeds that are in the H.H. H. Houston collection at the University Archives at the University of Pennsylvania. These uh, deeds document the transition on Topahawken Street. Here's Abby Johnson to John Littell, her uncle. Next. John Littell to John Fallon in 1850. Next. Christopher and John Fallon to their law partner, Isaac Serrell, in 1852. Do you see this? 61 acres of land, Germantown, 
in Philadelphia. Next slide. John Fallon and wife to George Strawbridge. We have that run of deeds uh, down at Penn, and I urge you, if you're interested in more local history, not to overlook the Henry Howard Houston collection at the University Archives at Penn. Now, let's keep moving. Next slide. Here is the waterworks. And let me talk with you about this a little bit, because it takes some explaining. This is Wayne Avenue coming here, vertical. This is the old St. Peter's Church. My understanding is it closed about a year ago. Is that true? Or it's being redeveloped yes. through. Has it been maybe a little longer? But these are the houses that were on Wayne Avenue. Here comes Walnut Lane. There's a line here that Walnut Lane follows until all the way up here you can see the dam over Paper Mill Run. That line was very interesting. Germantown had one of the earliest railroads in all of the Philadelphia area. It was called the Philadelphia Germantown and Norristown Railroad and it was laid out in the early 1830s and it came to a station at Germantown Avenue and Price Street that I can remember being demolished some 30 years ago. They laid out the ground for it further, but they couldn't build a bridge in the 1830s across the Wissahickon Gorge. It was not technically possible given the equipment, and the engineering skills that were available at that time. But the railroad had been graded, and this line is that grade. And the Fallons used it to build a dam and create that pond. It's still used today. Next slide. There it is. Walnut Lane comes down here. This line is the railroad. It turns. You see where Lincoln Drive is? This is Lincoln Drive. Here's Harvey Street. This is that little stub of a street called Morris Street. And woe be unto you if you go down to it and try to get on Lincoln Drive. <laughs> Up there, you can see. But you see Lincoln Drive goes right through the middle of the waterworks dam and the pond. Next slide. So we're down here. The Fallons are developing down here in these three parcels of ground. Next slide. This is a portion of that Topahawken Street development. We're going to come back to these. Hit two quickly. And again, and again, there. You see, there's the paper mill run. Here's Walnut Lane coming through. Again, that's what it looked like. They built a house here that had a pumping station in it. And they pumped the water up to the standpipe on Topahawken Street. The Fallons laid, are you ready for this, 135,000 feet of water pipe under the streets of Germantown between 1850 and 1866 when they sold to the city of Philadelphia. <coughs> Everywhere from Allen's Lane to Wayne Junction got running water. And running water, as you all know, is a game changer. I can't think of anybody in this room who would buy a house without running water. <laughs> and try operating your house if the water gets shut off. It won't work very long. Running water was made possible by Christopher and John Fallon at the base of Tolpahocken Street. And they used the base of Tolpahocken Street 
for a total of 5,000 customers in Germantown in the 1850s who were recipients of all of that footage of water pipes. So you can see why the building lots on Topahawken Street at first sold slow. The Fountains didn't care. This was their money maker. This was the enterprise that had been unleashed by John Fallon in 1851. Next slide. There's another look at it after the um, power house had been demolished and all that was left was the smokestack. Next slide. There's cutting ice on the pond. That's a very famous photograph from about 1883. I think Judith Callard put that in her book on historic Germantown. And what's really cool about it are the wagons down here with the huge blocks of ice in the wagon being uh, sent out to market. This is how people kept their meats and produce chilled all the way through the spring and summer. Next slide. That's the standpipe I was telling you about. And there's one daredevil fellow that you can't see very well. They're pulling it into the upright position and there's a guy standing on the pipe. <laughs> I don't think I would have volunteered for that job. Next slide, please. There's another picture of the waterworks. Another one. Do we have one more slide of the waterworks? Yeah, there it is. You see there, the water flowing over the dam, a young man sitting in his hat with his hat on, on a large boulder at the dam. I think the next slide takes us back to the map. All right. Do you see where we were? Right down here. There's Walnut Lane, modern day Walnut Lane, cutting across. And the Fallons had bought all of this when they first developed Topahawken Street. Afterwards, that land was sold to Henry Howard Houston. And Houston used it as the first of his purchases toward building the Chestnut Hill West commuter rail line. Houston bought up that land in 1872, well before the thought of a commuter rail line even entered his head. And I think that that's why when the city got together with the family and they went down on Harvey Street, I'm trying to see it here. Um, here it is. Harvey Street comes here, turns. This is the apartment complex I remember as Park Drive Manor, but it has a different name now. Um, like Rittenhouse Hill or something. Yeah, that's it. Right down here, there's a huge statue of Houston right on Lincoln Drive. If you've ever driven on Lincoln Drive, and I'll bet all of you have, you've driven past the statue of H.H. H. Houston. But that was the development of Topahawken Street in 1850 and 51. And I thank you very much for hearing me out. I'm happy to take questions, if there are any. I think Diane has a few more announcements to make, but I saw a hand go up over here. How did they power the, um, the water system? The power came from steam engines, coal and water, and the steam pushed the water up into the standpipe. Martha, yes. Is, uh, so the pond that you showed a picture of where they were ice cutting, is now partially filled by Lincoln Drive, and what's left is sort of the stream that runs along with a written house paper? Well, if you go up Lincoln Drive, there's flat area on both sides of the highway, right there at Walnut Lane, where the bridge, the, the Walnut Lane bridge now is very high in the air. But if you think about that bridge and the area underneath it, the highway takes up only a part of the flat space before it starts to rise on both sides. And where would I see the Henry Houston statue? 
Okay. I'm sorry. The Henry Houston statue is, a, is on Harvey, at Harvey and Lincoln. It's at the foot of Harvey Street. Okay. It's a whisper wall, too. I'm sorry. It's a whisper wall. Yes. Yes. Are those water pipes the ones that are only being replaced now? Oh, that's a good question. Are those water pipes only being replaced now? I don't want to besmirch the reputation of the Philadelphia Water Department, so I'm going to take the Fifth Amendment on that. I bet they are. Yes. Just wondering, with this water supply on the west side, did that have real implications for development in terms of that developing faster, or...? The water supply was distributed to the east side, east side as well. Too. Okay. All of Germantown. Yes. The, uh, did the ballots introduce uh, coal gas? The Maxwell Mansion was plumbed with coal gas lines when it was built. Where was the gas generated from? Where did that? The gas came from the Germantown Gas Works, which was over on Belfield Avenue by Worcester Street. The Philadelphia Gas work still has a station there. But that was another enterprise. You'll have to call me back to uh, give you the <laughs> history of it. <laughs> yes? When was the standpipe removed? Oh, the dam was removed about no, 1900. The, dam, the standpipe. Oh, the standpipe came down much earlier, about 1882. Because Houston bought it, and he wanted to develop it, and he knew that the city wasn't using the water anymore from the water pond there on Lincoln Drive, what is now Lincoln Drive. Yes? Do you know when was the last time they used um, the pond to cut out ice? Do you know how long that lasted? It lasted all through the 1880s and 1890s. I have two questions. One regarding the Pelham area where there was a steam plant, but I thought that was directly from those houses. And it I was. And I don't know when that was built. And the other is when Philadelphia consolidated, there was some big thing about all the varying uh, water supply uh, facilities. Yes, I can explain that to you. Okay. Well, the Pelham development is later. Yes. It's late 1880s early 1890s in that period. And that's when that steam plant was built. It had nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with the Fallons. Secondly, the city of Philadelphia expanded in the consolidation of 1854 to the present boundaries of the city and county of Philadelphia. But it took years and years afterward to consolidate all the water supplies. Okay? Yes? Can we back up to the steam plant for just a minute? Was that one of those steam plants that uh, heated houses through underground pipes? Or through yes, uh, up, in, up in the Pelham area. And it's, it was exclusive to the Pelham area of distribution of heat. That's so right. I can tell you more about that afterwards if you'd like to know more about it. I'll take one more question. Yes? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I missed something that you said, but uh, I, you said that uh, John Fallon um, bought a lot of this land in 1850, is that right? Yes. Okay. And then did you say he sold it to his brother in the 1858? He or? sold a half share. Half share. In okay. 1851. 1851. And then the two brothers worked together right. for seven years. Okay. So and then Christopher sold his half share back. Oh, okay. And that's when the trouble started. Okay, so, so what, what was sold to the city of Philadelphia in 1866? Then? In 1866, all the land that was left, and there wasn't much left, went with the waterworks and all the pipes and the business of all those customers to the city of Philadelphia. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. All right. Diane, I think we're ready for you. Um, if others of you have other questions, I'm good for them, but see me afterwards. <laughs>